quiz if you haven't done your quiz yet. All right. So we, we've, we've in, in many ways, we've left the molecular portion of our class behind for a moment. And uh, we'll start talking about the more organismic level and population level stuff before we get back into the molecular level. Yeah. Well, the quiz question number two, what was the intended? Uh, I admit to write phenotypic ratios, uh, but I didn't. And I just wrote predicted ratios. Um, yeah. Well, you, you want, so if you went phenotypic and you answered it that way, it would be marked correct. But if you went genotypic and marked it that way, then it would be marked incorrect, but it's actually correct and I need to go and fix it. All right. So again, for a moment, uh, for a moment, and, and this is until the last two weeks of class, so the next two weeks, we're going to take a step away from the molecular and talk about bigger picture. Okay, bigger picture, what's happening at the population level, what's happening at the organismic level. And in order to do that, we need to answer a series of questions, the first of which is this one. What did Gregor Mendel actually discover about genetics? Why, why is he by many considered to be the father of a modern understanding of inheritance. What did he do and, and what did it actually mean uh, as, as far as what we see going on uh, inside of organisms? So what did Mendel discover about genetics? First thing he did uh, was he discovered basically the, the principles, the laws, the rules uh, that govern how inheritance works. He was one of the first, not the first, but one of the first to really strive to understand how you could take an individual with these traits, an individual with these traits, cross them and produce offspring with, with certain traits. Now, he, re he really lucked out uh, in, in the organism that he chose, so he did most of his work, at least all of the work we know about, um, that, that was actually publishable and, uh, and made its impact, he, he, he studied pea plants. And so the nice thing, the reason I say he lucked out uh, is, is pea plants, um, all of their very obvious characters, that is flower color, seed color, plant size, seed texture, all of those were all basically determined by a single gene, which is wonderful because it's very hard to find that, find that happening inside of organisms. So he also did a lot of work with, uh, with honeybees and uh, none of it worked. And that's because very few of the obvious characters in honeybees are determined by a single gene, okay? But he really lucked out with pea plants. On top of that, all of the genes that, that, that determine these very obvious characters, again, like flower color, seed color, seed texture, plant size, they're all on separate chromosomes, which is just really wonderful. I mean, he picked about the best bot model organism you can think of to study inheritance in. And then on top of that, their generation times are very short and they're very hard to kill. I mean, they're very hardy plants, uh, these pea plants. Okay, so he focused on, on heritable features, these characters, that basically persisted generation after generation, but came in different forms that, are, that he called traits. Okay, so you have characters, a specific feature, like flower color, that varies, right? You've got white flowers, you've got purple flowers. Or seed color, you've got green and you've got yellow. Seed texture, you have smooth and wrinkled, okay? where you, it was a very obvious character, there was some variation, but the particular trait persisted generation after generation. So plants with white flowers, when they breed with other plants with white flowers, all of the offspring have white flowers. When you have plants with purple flowers and they breed with other plants with purple flowers, all of your offspring have purple flowers, okay? So I only chose characters that were very easy uh, to recognize um, and, and had some variation, but that the, the, they were passed down uh, from generation to generation. So what he discovered was something that was not consistent with the dominant idea of inheritance at the time, which is mentioned right here, blended inheritance. 
So the idea of inheritance at the time was basically that every, every cell in your body contributed a little bit of material that would then go and get concentrated in the gametes. Okay? And so if you had blue eyes, your blue eyes would deposit some material into your bloodstream that would then get carried into your gametes and would concentrate. And then so when your gametes fused with the gametes of another individual, whomever basically deposited the most of those particles was going to have the biggest impact on the phenotype of the offspring. Okay? So if you have blue eyes, again, your blue eyes are putting some of that blue material into your bloodstream that's concentrated in your gametes. If, if your gamete fuses with an individual with brown eyes, they are doing the same thing. And whomever deposited more of those particles into their gametes, that's what's going to win out. But you get kind of a blending of, of the traits, a blending of the traits. And so what Mendel showed was that this actually, this doesn't happen. We're not talking about different concentrations. No, he said that for every character, there are basically discrete factors. And so now we call these genes, Mendel didn't know anything about genes, but for every character like flower color, there are discrete factors that influence flower color. It's not like if you get a little bit of the purple and a little bit of the white, you're going to get something like a lighter purple. It's like, no, there's, there's purple, there's white. These are discrete factors that when they show up have very predictable influences on, on whatever that character is. Okay, and so what he found was that these discrete factors, again, now we call these genes, but these discrete factors will oftentimes appear completely unchanged generation after generation. So when he crossed a pea plant with purple flowers with a pea plant with white flowers, he didn't get a light purple flower. Okay, he got a purple flower. And then, so some of the traits disappeared, some of them persisted. But even if they disappeared, they would come back several generations later unchanged. They didn't blend out. They didn't just disappear, which was kind of the dominant idea of inheritance at the time. Which is why one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons why a lot of Charles Darwin's work was just trying to address how natural selection could possibly work. So if you've ever, re if you've ever read On the Origin of Species, by Charles Darwin. It's basically chapter after chapter after chapter is dealing with arguments against natural selection being possible. And that's because basically everybody at the time had an idea of a blended inheritance. So even if you had an individual develop some new trait, as they mated with other individuals in the population, it would just blend that trait out. Okay, it would basically be impossible to preserve some new trait. Okay, and so uh, these individual traits, you know, it, the traits are the particular flavor of that character or the particular form of that character. So again, if your character is flower color, the trait would be purple and white would be your two traits. And so what he, what he showed is that these traits are basically determined by the genotype, the genetic makeup of an individual. And again, he didn't know anything about genes. He didn't know anything about DNA. But what he did know is that whatever these traits were, they were determined by a very specific factor. There was no blending, okay? It was a very specific factor that was, again, with flower color, it was white or it was purple, okay? It wasn't just some combination. Now, the, the tough thing is, and the reason why we had this idea of this is the way inheritance works is because there are very few human characters determined by a single gene. So let's go back to eye color. You know where I told you if you've got blue eyes, the idea was you would deposit some of those particles into your blood and they would concentrate in your gametes. Uh, and then they would, you know, if you, your gamete fused with another individual. Human co eye color is influenced by at least 16 different genes. Which means it does actually show a little bit, it looks like it's blending out. So like sometimes you'll have somebody with blue eyes and somebody with brown eyes and their offspring will have kind of something in between. Like a, a type of hazel where you've got a brown ring and on the inner ring you have very little pigment. 
And so it almost looks like these traits are blending out. But then if you studied that, that family for long enough, you'd see somebody would come back with blue eyes and it would completely return like something you had seen several generations prior. Okay. And so the, this is what Mendel did, and I want to show you how he did this. He did it all with just crosses, took individuals with a certain trait, crossed them with individuals of a different trait, and, and watched how the offspring looked generation after generation after generation. Okay. So the first thing he did was called a one-character cross. And our next question is this. What is a one-character cross? What is a one-character cross? Okay, so in this, we've got, you know, a little bit about the anatomy of the flower, and uh, the only thing, I, there are two things I want to point out. One, we're talking about flower color, which was one of the characters he studied, and two, uh, talking about these structures called anthers inside the flower. So these structures inside the flower called anthers, this is where you develop the pollen. And the pollen, those are the male gametophytes. And inside of pollen, there is the male gametes, the sperm. And so what will happen is in most flowers, you have the male and the female parts in the same flower, and the flower will self-fertilize. Okay, pollen will drop out of these anthers into the pistil, which is the female structure that inside you've got the female gametes, and they will self-fertilize. And so what Mendel did is he removed the anthers off of these flowers before the flowers were able to reach sexual maturity. As the flowers were developing, he would remove the anthers off and he would separate the pollen aside so he can control which flowers got fertilized and by whom, okay? Which, that's weird to personify a plant. Um, which flowers got fertilized and by which pollen, okay? By, by which sperm, okay? And so here's, here's this, this one character cross. So instead of allowing the, the male flower to self-fertilize, okay, he, he keep these, these pollen grains from falling into the, the pistil and fertilizing this flower, or just not even care about this, this, these seeds at all, and took the pollen from here and used it to fertilize a female, uh, the female parts of a white flower. So what he was able to do here then is a one character cross, okay? Where he took an individual that has purple flowers, crossed it with an individual that has white flowers, and then looked at their offspring. And 100% of the offspring in this one character cross had purple flowers. You didn't get a blend, which is what blended inheritance would have predicted. That if you were across an individual with purple flowers with an individual with white flowers, you'd get a lighter purple you'd get a blend, a combination of those two traits. But that's not what he got. He got 100% of those offspring with purple flowers. But then what he did, and this is where he was able to actually demonstrate very, very clearly that you don't blend traits out, that traits are determined by a discrete factor because what he would do is he took two individuals in this generation, this is called F1, so two, two of the offspring of this cross, and he crossed two of the offspring. And then what he found is that that white character, that white trait, that white flower color reappeared in the F2, and in a very predictable ratio. And so here's a chart where it shows you the main characters that he looked at, and there are seven of them, or there's seven or eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. So flower color, seed shape, seed color, pod shape, pod color, flower position, and stem length. And again, he looked out. All of those characters are determined by a single gene. And all of those are on a separate chromosome. Yeah. Is this repeatable today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, just, yeah take, absolutely. Take a couple of plants home and, or a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually what we're going to do with our fruit flies. We're going to do this cross. Now, we're only using fly characters. The only fly character we're doing, we're basically going to do a one character cross. The fly color, the character is wings. And so we've got one trait, yes wings. 
the other trait, no wings, and then we're going to do a cross of these two individuals. And so what you'll find is that in F1, all of the offspring you produce should have wings, okay? They should all have wings. But then when you take larvae, or you, you take larvae from those offspring, and you allow them to grow, you'll see that that wingless character will reappear. Yeah? Is there any where it's like uh, you have one wing on one side and then no wings? Sure, but that's going to be a different issue altogether. That's oh. usually going to be a developmental abnormality, and now you're talking about a little bit more complicated issue to achieve. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can make legs grow where wings should be. We can make wings grow where antennae should be. But now you're talking about changing the developmental processes, and that's a little bit more complicated than just a single locus. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you could, you, could, you could do whatever you want. Like, if you want a fruit fly that doesn't have any wings but just has legs where the wings should be and legs where the antennae should be, so it's got ten legs instead of six, I mean, you, you can do that. I don't know why you would. <laughs> I mean, they really, they really wouldn't care. I mean, they'd, they'd pupate and they'd just, you know, in your tube, you put some food in there, they'd eat food, they'd find a mate, and, you know, they'd have a normal fruit fly life other than the fact that they can't fly. But they're in a tube anyways where they can't really fly. <laughs> anyways. Okay, and so here's the crosses. Here's purple with white. In F1, you only get purple. The white, char the white traits completely disappeared. A cross between round and wrinkled in this F1, all of them are round. Wrinkled has completely disappeared. Yellow and green, yellow is the only one that's there. Green has completely disappeared, so on and so forth. And then when you look at F2, you see that that trait that disappeared reappears now. And in a very predictable ratio, approximately 3 to 1. Okay, Approximately 3 to 1. So this is out of Mendel's uh, publication. 3.15 to 1, 2.96 to 1, 3.01 to 1, 2.95 to 1, 2.82 to 1, 3.14 to 1, 2.84 uh, to 1. Okay, approximately 3 to 1. And this is the phenotypic ratios. So when you take two individuals from F1, which are the offspring of this one character cross, right? F1, these are the offspring of the one character cross. If you take two of these offspring and you mate them, and you take all of their offspring, their offspring are going to have a three to one ratio of the, what we would call the dominant trait to the recessive trait. But that recessive trait, it didn't get blended out, which is again, what the blending hypothesis would predict is that this should have been a lighter purple, right, a mixture of purple and white, and that white would forever disappear. You'd never see it again. But that's not what happened, white reappeared, yeah. So with some of those recessive traits on the F2 generation, could they be like mix match, like white flower with round? Oh, sure, yeah. It's, but now you're talking about two character or three character crosses. Okay. We'll get there. We're not ready oh, for that yet. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to two. We'll, we'll do two character crosses. Uh, we could do some three character crosses, but the math gets the math gets complicated. So the math is pretty simple in a, a two-character cross. And then if you don't care, you're just going to let a computer do the algebra for you, then it doesn't matter. I mean, you could do a seven-character cross and do them all because the computer will do the algebra for you. It's, it's algebra, but... Okay. That's a pretty simple binomial, right? You're like, okay, I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with this. Uh, how am I going to do this? No, no, I don't like that. I'll show you a different example. I, I can't. I, it's it's Monday and math is tough on Mondays. Have we had this conversation before? I couldn't do the I couldn't do the algebra in my head. I'll, I'll work it out later. And so to sum all this up, a one character cross. It, it's it's basically you take two true breeding individuals, and what we mean by true breeding is that that individual with those purple flowers, when they self fertilize, they always produce plants with purple flowers. 
the individuals with the white flowers, when they self-fertilize, they always produce offspring with white flowers. <laughs> and so true breeding individuals will always pass on their traits when they mate with individuals with the same traits, especially when they self-fertilize. Oh, we already talked about this. Because pea plants self-fertilize, he had to cut the anthers off of flowers in order to do the cross. The F1 generation is the offspring of that one character cross, the offspring of the parents, that parental generation. And then F1 individuals will self-fertilize or be allowed to self-fertilize or, or you can cross them with another offspring in the F1 uh, to produce the F2. And now we call those crosses a mono-hybrid cross. And I'll show you why that is in a minute. Why we have a special name for that type of cross. And the big one here, and the one that really got Mendel working with these other characters was that flower coloring, that flower color cross. Crossing individuals with purple flowers with individuals with white flowers, and one, not seeing a blend between those two traits, and then two, seeing that white color reappear, basically unchanged. Okay. So I want to show you this. I, I don't have this worked out on a slide because I like to work this out on the board. And what I like for you to do, for you to do, is 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 to write this down. Okay. So if we take a female with this genotype here, so we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but that's okay. We take this female here and this female produces purple flowers. And here I'm going to do that so you can see that when we take this male, you can tell very clearly that these are lowercase p's, and this male produces white flowers. Now, when we cross these two individuals, we're not really so concerned with we're not really so concerned with representing every um, single gamete that they produce. We're really concerned with talking about what types of gametes are they capable of producing. Now, we've already learned about meiosis. And so if, if this individual is capital P, capital P, you know that the paternal copy of that chromosome has a capital P, and the maternal copy of that chromosome has a capital P, right? We've already learned this. And we also know that during meiosis, when we're forming gametes, every gamete is only going to get one copy of that genome, right? Right now, these cells have two copies of the genome, the diploid version of this plant, but the gametes are only going to have one copy of this genome. And this female can only make one type of gamete, right? She can only make a gamete that has the capital P. That's all she has. Both her copies of that gene are capital P. So yes, when she goes through meiosis, she's going to take this one cell and she's going to make four haploid cells, right? Going through meiosis one and meiosis two. But all of her gametes, 100% of her gametes are going to be capital P. Do you agree? That's all she has. She can't make any other type of gamete. What about this male? He can also only make one type of gamete because he only has one type of allele for this gene. And what is it? It's a lowercase p. So 100% of the male gametes are going to have the lowercase p. Does that make sense? Now, if any indi one individual germ cell from this male goes through meiosis, we're going to make four haploid cells. But all four of those haploid cells are going to have this lowercase p. And you're like, how do you take two alleles and spread them among four cells? What happens before meiosis? Mm -hmm. DNA duplication to where we take 
two alleles and we duplicate it and now we have four alleles that can be spread among four haploid cells, right? Yep. What phase is that where the DNA is duplicated? S phase, okay? So when we do this cross, typically you'll, you'll see people will, will do this Punnett square and they'll represent all of the different you know, alleles, but she can only make one type of gamete. So I, we just put a capital P there, that's all she can make. We only need to represent one allele because she can only make one type of gamete. And then for our male here, I'll put this here so we know that this is lowercase. I could have just picked a letter that looks very different than its lowercase form, but I didn't. Okay. And so now when we do this cross, this is the only type of sperm this male can make. Okay. All of the 100% of the male sperm are going to have the lowercase p. 100% of the ova are going to have the capital P. So if a sperm fertilizes an ovum, it's always going to be the same combination. One capital P, one lowercase p. That's your only option. Our male can only make one type of gamete. Our female can only make one type of gamete. Okay? Which means 100% of the F1 generation is going to have this genotype. Okay? And if capital P is dominant, what, what phenotype are they going to have? Purple. Capital P, you know, the purple color. So that's why white disappeared in F1, because 100% of the offspring between these two individuals okay, have this genotype. All right, so now what I want you to do, we'll take ourselves a little lecture break. We're a little late. It's 1220. Um, but what I want you to do, working with those around you, I want you to take a random female from F1, a random male from F1, and I want you to illustrate all the different gametes that they can make and set up your cross. Don't run your cross yet. Just set up your cross. So take a random female from F1, a random male from F1, illustrate all the gametes that they can make, and get your cross ready to go. And then we'll, we'll do our cross in 90 seconds. Okay? 90 seconds, get your gametes illustrated from a random female, random male, get your cross ready to go. 90 seconds starting now. Got about 10 seconds to get your cross ready. Okay. Any random female from F1, what's her genotype? Capital P and lowercase p, right? Because 100% of the individuals from F1 have that genotype. That's our only option. Okay, what about our random male chosen? What's his genotype? Capital P, lowercase p. That's our only option because 100% of the individuals at F1, and especially if these self fertilize. So remember, every flower is both male and female. So the female gametes are going to be made by the female gametophyte. Okay? Or the female, better, better thing to say would that a female gametophyte, which is going to be haploid, uh, is going to be made by the sporophyte, and which, which had this genotype here. Okay, now, this female now can make two different types of gametes, right? She can make gametes that have the capital P, and she can make gametes that have the lowercase p. And it should be 50-50. 
Half of her gametes should have the capital P, half of their gametes should have the lowercase p, because that's how meiosis works, right? Right? We just got done talking about meiosis. You're like, Dr. Engel, we had a test on Friday, and meiosis wasn't on it. I don't know. <laughs> I might be able to answer that question prior to the final, when we actually will have meiosis on an exam. I get it. Yeah. So there would be four technically, but the censored two. Of the well, yeah. Together. So if you took one germ okay. cell, it would it would uh, it, it would be split uh, evenly among four haploid cells. But we would duplicate the DNA prior to that, so we'd end up with two copies of capital P, two copies of lowercase p. Yes. Yeah. That are spread among four haploid cells. Okay. So two of them will have the capital P, two would have the lowercase p. Okay. Right. right. That okay? Again, I understand that meiosis hasn't appeared on an exam yet. But surprise, it will. And you know we only have four weeks left until finals? What day of the week is our exam? Is it on Monday of finals week? It's on Wednesday? Oh, so you have four weeks from Wednesday? Four weeks from Wednesday until the final exam. So this male can make two different types of gametes. Gametes that have the capital P and gametes that have the lowercase p, and it should be 50-50 again. Because prior to meiosis, we will duplicate the DNA. We'll end up with two copies of capital P, two copies of lowercase p. Okay, and then we'll split those during meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Okay, so now when we do a cross, the reason why we call this a monohybrid cross is because these individuals at one locus, which that's what mono means is one, right? These individuals at one location are hybrid. They have two different two different traits at a single character. So we call these monohybrid individuals. Because at a single locus mono, they are hybrid. They have two different traits. Okay, so this would be different because this individual makes purple flowers, right? So if the individual has two capital P's, what color are their flowers? Purple. 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 The individual has one capital P, what color are their flowers? Purple. purple. But genetically, they're very different. This individual is true breeding. It will always produce purple flowers. This individual is not true breeding. Even if it self-fertilizes, it'll produce white flowers. Okay? Make sense? And so we have to note that there's something different about these. They, they're still purple. The flowers are still purple, but they're different. Okay? And so now when we do a cross here, let me do this cross over here. So now we're going to cross these individuals. Now we actually need to represent two different options. The female could have produced a gamete that was capital P. She also could produce a gamete that is lowercase p. Half of her gametes will have the capital P. Half of her gametes will have the lowercase p. What about the male, same our average same male? Thing. Same thing. Capital P, lowercase p. Okay, and so now we need to actually represent a cross where we have four different options. So if this sperm fertilizes this ovum, what do we have? Capital P, capital P. If this sperm fertilizes this ovum, what do we have? Capital P, lowercase p. If this sperm fertilizes this ovum, what do we have? Capital P, lowercase p. And if this sperm fertilizes this ovum, what do we have? Lowercase p, lowercase p. And look at that. Now our white flower comes back. Right? And so our the ratio of our genotypes would be, well, where did the P come from? Capital P, capital P, to capital P, lowercase p, to lowercase p, lowercase p. And the ratio of these genotypes would be 1 to 2 to 1. That would be our predicted ratio of our genotypes of this cross. So if you produce 400 offspring, statistically speaking, 100 of them should be capital P, capital P. 200 of them should be capital P, lowercase p, and 100 of them should be lowercase p, lowercase p. Okay? But then our ratio of purple to white that's a different thing altogether. What color is this flower going to be? Purple. What color is this flower going to be? Purple. What color is this flower going to be? Purple. So three out of every four of our offspring are going to have a purple flower. And then what color is this flower going to be? White. 
one out of every four will have that white flower. And so remember that the chart I showed you, Mendel did these with all seven characters, and that F2 generation where you do a monohybrid cross, a cross between individuals that have two different traits at that one locus, the phenotypic ratios were always right around three to one, right? And this again, this is not what you would predict if blended inheritance were true. First of all, you would have predicted that you wouldn't have had a purple flower in the F1. It would have been a light purple, a mixture of purple and white. And then second of all, in the F2, you would never predict that the white would return basically unchanged. Okay, make sense? Okay. So, Mendel described two laws, two principles, two rules from doing his crosses. The first one is the principle of segregation, or the law of segregation, or the rule of segregation. And so, a principle of segregation basically uh, boils down to this, that individuals have two copies of that discrete factor, and when they make gametes, only one of the two copies makes it into a gamete, okay? That individuals have two copies of whatever that factor is that determines the character. But when they make gametes, those gametes get a single copy of that factor. Okay, and so for here, we're illustrating this, where we're doing two true breeding individuals. So this individual with capital P, all of the gametes are gonna have capital P. This individual with lowercase p, all of the individuals are gonna have lowercase p. Look at that, without the underlining, like how do you even notice, this one's a little bit bolder, a little thicker. And then basically walking you through this cross. Same cross we did here, where we cross a true breeding purple individual with a true breeding white individual. 100% of their offspring, F1, are going to have purple flowers, but 100% of their offspring are going to be monohybrids, have two different traits for that same character, but one trait was dominant to the other. And so when we cross, here's the same cross illustrated here. I guess you can see the little, the little piece of the line that goes up above <coughs> to see that it's lowercase b. So what is the principle? It's the segregation. Adults have two alleles for each gene. And again, Mendel didn't know what genes were, but we have a better understanding of how the DNA is actually structured. So Mendel didn't say that adults have two alleles for each gene, that he said that they have two discrete factors for every one character. If the two alleles or the two factors are different, we call those individuals heterozygous, and one of them is dominant to the other. One of them is dominant to the other one, we call that one recessive. True breeding individuals are homozygous. Their two copies of that factor are the same. Their two alleles for that gene are the same. And here's the principle of segregation. As gametes are formed, the two copies of that factor, the two alleles for that gene, segregate. And every gamete gets one of the two. Yeah? Which ones can we call true breeding? True breeding individuals are homozygous individuals. And the reason why they're true breeding is because all of their gametes are going to contain whatever the allele is for their color. Right? So an individual can have purple flowers but be heterozygous, which means some of their gametes are going to contain the allele for white flowers, even though they're purple flowers. So it's the genotype? Yes. Yeah, true breeding refers to the genotype. So true breeding is an indication that it's somebody with the dominant phenotype that is also has two copies of that dominant allele. Okay. So they can only produce gametes with the dominant allele. Can they also have like the recess, the, uh, recess alleles? No, only if they're a monohybrid individual. True breeding individuals can't have both alleles. 
True breeding individuals, their two copies of the allele have to be the same. And the, the thing is, true breeding individuals with that dominant character, even if you cross them with somebody with the recessive trait, they're, all of the offspring are still going to have that dominant trait. But all of the offspring would also have the, a, a copy for the recessive trait. So principle of segregation, again, individuals, they've got two alleles for every gene or two copies of the factor for every character. And when you make gametes, those two copies segregate and half of the gametes get one of the copies, half of the gametes get the other copy. And that's what we illustrated here, right? So here we have two individuals that are heterozygous. We've got two different alleles for this gene or two different copies of the factor for this character. And when you're forming gametes, they segregate. Half of the gametes get one, half of the gametes get the other. Okay, and this is the principle of segregation. And so what we mean by this is that just because an individual <coughs> is producing a purple flower, they are still capable of having offspring with that white flower, but only if they are monohybrid. We have one last question that we'll deal with today and, and then we'll be, we'll be done for today. And again, if you weren't here right before, or right when class started, uh, I will have your exams ready uh, to hand back on Wednesday. Okay, the last question we need to deal with today is how does probability factor into genetics? How does probability factor into genetics? Another way to ask this question is how do we use probabilities when we are studying genetics? When we are studying genetics. And the answer to that question is essentially we can multiply probabilities rather than working out these crosses. And so this, this is a pretty neat way to illustrate this. And so what they've done is they've illustrated something that also has a 50-50 uh, probability. So here, if you've got a monohybrid individual, the probability of making a gamete with the dominant allele is 50-50, one half, right? Half of the gametes will have the dominant allele, half of the gametes will have the recessive allele. Well, flipping a coin also happens to be 50-50, one half, right? The probability of flipping a head is one and two. The probability of flipping a tails is one and two. And so what they did was they illustrated something. Let's say we were to do a cross between a monohybrid individual. So this individual is a coin that could be either heads or tails. Half of the flips will be heads, half of the flips will be tails, right? And we'll cross it with another monohybrid individual, another coin, where half of the tosses will be heads, half of the tosses will be tails, and then we actually did this cross, okay? So if you do this cross, you get two heads, right? If you do this cross, you get a head and a tail. You do this cross, you get a tail and a head. You do this cross, you get two tails. And so what it shows you is that the, the probability of getting two heads is equal to the probability of flipping a head on this toss multiplied by the probability of flipping ahead on this toss, okay? And the reason why I worked you through all of that was just to demonstrate that we don't really need to do these crosses unless you really want to, okay? You don't really need to do these crosses. You can just multiply the individual probabilities. So if you wanna know what percentage of the offspring are gonna have two capital P's, it's the probability of any one individual producing a gamete with a capital P, which is one half times the probability of a second individual producing a capital P, which is also one half, which is one fourth. And that's exactly what we find. One in every four offspring should have two copies of the dominant allele. You're like, well, it's really not that big of a deal. This really didn't take very long. But what if you want to do what Chris wants to do, and you want to have like three character, four character, five character crosses? All right, that's what you're asking, right? Yeah. So now it's like, okay, well now it, this is a little bit different. It's a little bit different. So if you wanted to figure out the probability, let's, let's say we wanted to add a second character into here. And so now we're talking about purple flowers and yellow seeds, okay? We can do the probability of producing a gamete with a purple flower, multiply that by the probability of producing a gamete with a yellow seed, and we can do that rather than doing these crosses, right? And so it gives us a, it gives us a couple of options. We could do the crosses, which we all love, right? You've all done Punnett squares before? And you love them, like you missed them. 
You're like, I just, I couldn't wait until we got to the point in cell biology where we were gonna start doing these again. And you know what the best part is? I don't know if you've done this before when you've done, it, when you've used Punnett squares, but we'll do it, we'll do it in this class, we'll do it in, in lab especially and a little bit in lecture, but we'll start taking, okay, this is what you would predict a one to two to one ratio. This is what we actually got. Are my data statistically significant? Is there evidence there to suggest that it's not conforming to Mendelian inheritance? <laughs> You're gonna love it. Yeah, chi-squared. All right. Well, that's it for today. Uh, again, those of you that have lab today, uh, we definitely have lab today, but if you need to schedule something, uh, at 2.30, feel free to do so, because lab's going to take about five minutes today. But don't worry, this lab will not be done until our semester ends. So if you're like, I can't have a five-minute long lab, you won't. It's just going to be broken into pieces.